Henry Stevens of the Washington Post posted it. So let's see if I can. If you like bouncing balls explaining how to slow down coronavirus, this is a correct answer, Jamie. My latest story in the Washington Post is for you. Outbreaks like coronavirus spread exponentially, how to flatten the curve. So let's take a look. Uh, also, I am a paying member of the Washington Post because it's my original hometown newspaper. Uh, okay, so after, the, I'm just gonna kind of read along with you because I haven't seen this before. After the first case of COVID-19, the disease caused by the new strain was announced in the US, reports of further infection trickled in two months later. So this is basically like an image of what exponential growth looks like. And I think, again, I'm gonna pause because psychologically, we're not trained for that as human beings. Um, we have a very like linear kind of geometric growth, maybe mindset, but we don't expect tomorrow to look radically different from today. And I think what you've got to anticipate, what we've all got to brace ourselves for is that, you know, we joke about it in the age of Trump, like every week feels like a year, but in exponential math, every week is a year in like a data perspective. Um, and so the jump from like, you know, March 3rd from 122 to March 13th, 2179, that's not steady as, as, it, as it goes. So they're explaining what exponential curves are. I like that. Um, and without any measures to slow it down, like social distancing, it will continue to spread exponentially for months. That's real. Um, so we will call our fake disease <laughs> simulitis because it's from a simulation, get it? It spreads even more easily. Let me just um, make this a little smaller for those of you on a phone that might help. Um, We'll call our fake disease simulitis. It spreads even more easily than COVID-19. So whenever a healthy person, which is a green dot, comes into contact with a sick person, it's kind of brownish dot, the healthy person becomes sick too. So I'm gonna play this and you see, oh look, it's like the chain of infection because visualize, great. I'm so happy to know when I'm not slinging bullshit. All right, so in a population of just five people, it doesn't take long for pretty much everyone to catch uh, simulitis. Now in real life, of course, people recover. So a recovered person can neither transmit it to a healthy person nor become sick again. So they've kind of got that simulation. The first person's recovered, the second person's recovered. And so that bounce back doesn't kind of reinfect them. That population is, is contaminated, but unable at a certain point, you know, if they're not contacting uninfected people to spread it further. School matters, y'all. I just want to. I just want to point that out. Um, yeah, healthy young people can pass along. You know, the infection of vulnerable people. Uh, thank you, Kathleen. So let's see what happens when simulitis spreads in a town of two hundred people. And thank you to whoever drew on my screen. We will start everyone in town at a random position, moving at at a random angle, and we will make one person sit. And you can kind of see, and they plotted it. The, the chart of kind of cumulative sick people. And you see how fast the town is done, right? And like time increments of what? And then people are recovering. So they chose a town the size of Whittier, Alaska, 200 people. So it was able to spread quickly across the entire population. And that whole population is infected, recovered, and can't get reinfected, which in the absence of a vaccine, it feels like how you sort of quote unquote beat this thing or, or at least get through it. Um, what the art author is saying in this article, in a country like the US though, with 330 million people, the curve would steepen for a long time before it started to slow. And when it comes to the real COVID-19, we would prefer to slow the spread of the virus before it infects a large portion of the US population. To slow stimulitis, we've created a, a forced quarantine such that uh, <laughs> I'm multitasking y'all. So, uh, but I just got a, a message, Ross Martin, thank you. Uh, can I just say this is better than the democratic debate that I'm watching right now? Um, and he already read this article. So thank you, they, they already read this Ross. Um, but back to my reading. So essentially they're plotting a simulation coming up, I'll scroll and activate it, but what's gonna happen in this is that they're trying to slow the spread that they showed us above by creating a forced quarantine on a certain part of the population. 
such as what China did in the Hubei province. And so we see how that goes. Uh, quarantine on the left, open population on the right. And this curve is flattened. And when people are talking about flattening the curve, that's what they mean. You don't want this thing to arch real high. You want to kind of smooth it out. It's like in driving lessons when you're, you know, accelerating off of a stop or like approaching a stop sign, you don't slam on the accelerator, you don't slam on the brakes. You can overwhelm um, your passengers, you know, especially if it's a driving instructor who doesn't really appreciate that. You have to, have to do the class again because uh, you're so heavy footed. That didn't happen to me. I'm just saying like some people out there might totally identify with that kind of, um, you know, analogy. So uh, the rest of the story, many people work in the city, live in the neighborhood where people be separated from their families. Um, some people will still go out. Let's see what happens when a quarter of our population continues to move around while the other three quarters adopt a strategy of what health experts call social distancing. So if you keep the dots still, right? Hey, Baratunde, don't maybe fly around the country talking to thousands of people at a time, right? Which is totally stopped, by the way. Um, but it, you, you, again, you flatten that curve. More social distancing keeps even more people healthy and people can be nudged away from public places by removing the alert. For example, by closing <laughs> as many responsible churches bars, restaurants, retail outlets, um, and, and, and conferences and gatherings have started to do. We control the desire, desire to be in public spaces by close. It's like I wrote this article, y'all, <laughs> by closing down public spaces, at least closing its restaurants. China's closing everything, um, and we're closing things now, too. And then they're simulating even more social distance. But I think y'all get the idea, so I'm, I'm not going to continue. Um, but that's why, uh, Jane, we don't just focus on quarantining the sick uh, because we all potentially can be the sick and we're interconnected as much as we feel like uh, selfishly uh, separate from each other if there is any proof that we're all interconnected a virus is here to remind us that we're we're like actually one people uh, so you know spiritually folks have been saying that quantum physicists have been saying it and now the epidemiologists are reminding us uh, as well uh, and and the if it's not been obvious, because I don't know how much information people have been consuming and I've been doing maybe too much, you the reason you flatten the curve isn't just for the sake of it, it's because our society and our health infrastructure is designed to withstand a certain amount of pressure, right? And so when I'm talking about punching the accelerator or slamming on the brakes, like your passengers, they don't appreciate that and they some of them can't handle it, right? And you get nauseous, you throw up and I think, our hospitals don't appreciate that. Uh, and in the literal sense, they cannot handle it. And so what's, what David shared with us is that's happening in, in Italy, we, uh, you know, people who need to go to the ER because they have to deliver a baby, or maybe they broke their leg, rock climbing or any old thing, uh, that system is gonna be overwhelmed by all these cases that we could have spread out and given the system a chance to adapt. Our testing can't keep up. Our, our treatment, our, you know, testing, diagnosis, treatment, um, not just of COVID-19 cases, but of everything else the medical system is supposed to accommodate. And that's how systems break down. Uh, it starts because of one case, but if hospitals can't serve anybody, then that has a ripple effect to everyone who's sick for other reasons or injured for other reasons. And so people who might not have died would die. We saw it in Puerto Rico with the hurricane. And when this argument about how many people died in, in due to Hurricane Maria, uh, well, what do you count as a hurricane death? Was it somebody who got hit by a flying piece of debris? Was it someone who drowned due to the rising waters? Was it someone who couldn't re-up on their asthma medication or other prescription because they couldn't physically reach the hospital? You know, if you have an underlying health condition and this impact to the health system prevents you from accessing the care you would under a normal scenario, then you're a victim of this disaster, just kind of a second order, but you still count. Uh, so that's what we're, uh, what we have to look forward to in some ways. All right, I'm going to check the chat and I thank